Thank you very much. We're going to be studying together today the laws of conversion, Geirut, the idea of someone becoming Jewish. The idea behind this, just very, very briefly, is based on the first letter in the Torah. Genesis does not start with an Aleph. You may have noticed that. Genesis starts with the letter Bet, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, if I was writing the Torah, sometimes I've thought of before, but uh, art school does not allow me to. But uh, if I was writing the Torah, I would want to start it with an Aleph, first letter of the alphabet. Makes sense. Symbolically, it would be very, very nice. Big Aleph, front of the page. Why does the Torah start with a Bet, not with an Aleph? The answer is simple, but a very deep idea. The answer is that Aleph is one, is oneness, unity. God is one, God is unity, God is the ultimate unity and oneness, unique oneness. The creation of the world, creation of a physical world, the creation of people with free will, with egos, with dignity, etc., etc., was a, so to speak, an apparent compromise on the unity and the absolute unity of God. Meaning, he had to somehow conceal his unity, he had to hide it. There had to be what's called, Kabbalistic jargon, it's called a breaking of the vessels. You see the world as a beautiful jigsaw puzzle. You see a beautiful jigsaw puzzle, beautiful picture. Sorry, sorry, it's fine. I think everyone can hear. Right. Uh, you see the world as a beautiful picture, like, like the cover of a jigsaw puzzle. And then, you know, if you're a little kid, you open up the box and you dump it all out and you've got a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And you try to put it together to achieve that picture that it began with. That's what we're here for. We are here in the world of base, meaning the world of two-ness, the world of two-ness, to try to turn that back into the world of oneness, to get from the bait back to the Aleph. Humans, Ramosha Chaim Lozato says, are unity seekers. We seek unity. We get pleasure when we have unity. When foods, flavors, taste, aromas, textures come together, in a beautiful hole, as they did in this incredible oriental buffet, right, then there's a uh, feeling of unity. That is to say, there's an experience of it's pleasure. Music, different instruments, different notes, different tones, etc., come together in a harmonious whole, pleasure. Art, also like that. When two people come together with love, there is a tremendous pleasure in that. There's a unity in that. When we're together in a whole group, we experience the oneness, closeness with other people, then there's also a tremendous feeling of unity. We're getting back from the base, we're going to the, the Aleph. Part of that unity, the Jewish people are supposed to accomplish, that had we been in Israel with the temple, as it existed in its pristine, spiritual, beautiful state, with our philosopher kings, like King Solomon, with the teaching of Torah, with an entire country running according to the harmonies of Torah, the agriculture, the politics, the economics, the military, etc., et everything running according to the harmony of the Torah, then that country would attract people like a magnet. People would come to that country and would want to learn Torah. Gentiles would want to know what is going on here. From Zion, so come, they'd come to Jerusalem, they'd, want to be, they'd be interested in this. What exactly is being said here? That would unify the world. We failed in that failed miserably, right? And uh, the temple was destroyed because we didn't even have unity amongst ourselves. The temple was destroyed because we had inner hatred. And so we failed in that. So God exiled us all over the world. He exiled us to Rome, to Sparta, to New Jersey, right, etc. Right? And there are Jews all over the world. And the sages tell us that the idea, one of the concepts says the Jews were exiled amongst the nations so that, so that, the Gentiles, so that converts will come and cling to the Jewish people. Very interesting thought. Right? That's the reason for exile. I thought exile was a punishment. The answer is it is a punishment, but it's, a, but it's done in such a way. God wants us to like, take the sparks of holiness there are, there are in the world and elevate them and unify them. When a sincere, a sincere person comes and wants to join the Jewish people, become a convert... That's a little bit of a piece of the jigsaw puzzle coming back together <coughs> as it should be. It's a little bit of the base coming back to the Aleph. And we had many, many famous, famous converts. The most famous convert we're going to read about in 10 days, Ruth. Ruth, who was a Moabite who converted to Judaism, and her great-grandson became was King David, 
who of course was the D Davidic line lineage and the Messiah comes from King David. That is to say he is descended from Ruth, the convert. Uh, we have many sages in the Mishnah who were converts. Shemaiah and Avtalion, who were the teachers of the famous pair Hillel and Shammai, they were head of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. They were converts to Judaism. We have two of the great sages mentioned in Ethics of the Fathers who were so proud of the fact that they are converts that their names indicated that. You ever heard of Ben Hey Hey and Ben Bug Bug? Strange names, bizarre names, right? Like Snoop Doggy Dog of the mid, right? Like bizarre names. Like, what's, what's, go, what's Ben Hey Hey and Ben Bug Bug? Rabbi Reuven Margolius, a very great sage of last century, the 1900s. Remember that. So uh, ben -Hey, he says that Ben Hey Hey, he says, was a man whose both father and mother were converts. So he says, I am the son of someone who had a Hey, the letter Hey added to their name. Who had a letter Hey added to his name when he became part of the covenant with God? Abraham. He was Avram, he had a hay added, he became Avraham. And who else had a hay added to her name? Sarai, who when she converted became Sarah, with a hay. So he was ben hay hay. I'm the son, he said, of two hays. Two people who had the letter hay added to their name. Ben Bug Bug is more obvious. It's, what's an, acro it's an acronym. Beit Gimel is an acronym for Ben Ger, Ben Gioret. Son of a convert, a male convert, son of a female convert. Every major edition of the five books of Moses has printed alongside the text an Aramaic translation of the text written by Onkelos, a nephew of one of the Roman Caesars who converted to Judaism and became such a great scholar that his commentary translation is so authoritative it is printed in virtually every edition of the five books of Moses, Hebrew edition. Not only that, but the Talmud says that one should actually review the portion of the week every week, going twice through the portion of the week and once through the translation of Onkelos, the convert. So these were successful situations in which these people were absorbed into the Jewish people. So, and that's part of what it's about. And these people, where do these souls come from? Just to mention a very, uh, this is a short introduction, but the Zohar, do not mess with the Zohar, but the Zohar, which is the Jewish mystical text, why is that funny? Anyway, anyway so, so the, um, the Jewish mystical text, the Zohar, tells us, you know, that the verse tells us that when Abraham and Sarah, it says, that when they came to Israel from Haran, it says they brought with them et hanefesh asher asu Haran. That means the souls that they created in Haran. And the Zohar says, how can they create, you can't create a soul. There's a story about a scientist who challenged God. He said, I can also make life. He says, yeah, I'll show you. He goes outside to get some clay, and the voice from heaven comes out. And he says, whoa, 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 get your own clay, buddy. <laughs> right? So no one can actually create. You cannot create a soul. So what does it mean, the Zara asks, that they created souls? The standard explanation is, and this is the Talmud's explanation, is it refers to people that they brought in and brought in to a relationship with God, so to speak, uh, converts at that time, even though there was no official Judaism, but converts, people they brought in, they were souls that they made. There's another explanation of the Zohar, which is very, very beautiful. The Zohar's explanation is that we are told that during the time Abraham and Sarah, they lived together as man and wife, but they didn't have children. And not until they were in Israel for 10 years did they have children. Right? They, were, they, had, they didn't have children for a long time, most of their marriage. So, but it's interesting, but they still lived together as man and wife. So the Zohar says they didn't create their intimacy did not create physical beings, but they did create souls. They created souls. And those souls that Abraham and Sarah created became the souls of converts in the future. And the convert calls themselves Ben or Bat Abraham, son or daughter of Abraham. And according to the Zohar, they are literally so, because their soul is literally created by the union of Abraham and Sarah before they had physical children, they created their spiritual children. So that's what, a, that's what a convert is. It's a little bit of a perspective on what we're learning. Of course, we're now going to get into the technical nitty gritty of the laws of conversion. And you have sources before you. Don't feel you have to finish all of them uh, because uh, not, this will not all be on the final. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, as much of them as you can get through and then we'll review them afterwards and I'll try to explain them and uh, elucidate them uh, and uh, try to confuse you with a few more sources and uh, hopefully uh, come out with some, uh, with some ideas about conversion, about the laws of conversion. And uh, that's it for now. And uh, carry on.
So you've all probably gone through the sources, at least many of the sources. I'm assuming everyone has finished the first one or two. Right? That's, that's great. Uh, as you've probably seen from the first source, the first two sources, which is the Gemara, the Talmud in Tractate Kritut, and also Maimonides, who legislates it, basically, the idea is there's only one way to become Jewish. There's only one way to become Jewish, which is you've got to go to Mount Sinai. <laughs> basically, I should turn off my cell phone probably, right? Uh, but um, if you don't go to Mount Sinai, you can't be Jewish. There's no other way. So that means either your ancestors were at Mount Sinai, in which case, just like your DNA was there, so is your soul, in which case, you're a Jewish. Or you've got to go through your own Mount Sinai experience as a Gentile who wants to become Jewish has to do. That's the basic idea of conversion. And as Maimonides puts it, as the Jews entered the covenant in, with three things, there was bris miller, circumcision, there was immersion, purification, and there was a sacrifice. So also, every convert for all generations, to the extent that it is possible, because sacrifices are no longer done now, but a man has to have circumcision, and both men and women must immerse in the mikveh. There seems to be one thing missing that Maimonides doesn't seem to mention, which is a very central idea. What did the Jews do when they came, after having immersed in the mikveh, after having purified themselves on Mount Sinai, after having circumcision, after having the sacrifice, what did they do? What is the actual covenant? If you look carefully, what it says is, Maimonides says, they, our forefathers entered the covenant with three things. But he hasn't actually said what the covenant itself is. Do you notice that? In other words, they entered the covenant with these three things, to prepare them to enter the covenant. What is the covenant itself? That he doesn't explain. What is the covenant? Does anyone know? What well, the covenant itself it says our ancestors entered the covenant with three things. So also everyone who wants to convert, everyone, a Gentile or to be politically correct, a Jewishly challenged individual, right? Everyone who wants to become Jewish for all generations must enter into the covenant with these three things. What's the covenant? Anyone ask that? Was anyone discussing it? I'm sorry? That is correct. But how was that? What, what's the, the, in a more technical or historical fashion, what did the Jews do or say? Yes? The circumcision itself. When Abraham made the covenant, when uh, he slapped it, when uh, No, because if you, well, that's a good try. But if you look carefully at the language here, it says they entered into the covenant with three things. Circumcision, immersion, sacrifice. That's how they entered into the covenant. What's the covenant? In other words, the circumcision is how, they, how the men at least entered into the covenant. What's the covenant itself? This is a central question. The answer, I'll give you the answer. I'm in a good mood, so I'm going to give you the answer. <laughs> For a change, you know, it's like, what is it? How many months has been? Okay, right. So the answer is this. Oh, oh, we have an answer there? Dedication. That's correct. They dedicated themselves to keeping the Torah. What did the Jews actually say? Na seven ishma. That's right. Two, point, two points for... Uh, for uh, Slytherin. Uh, oh, sorry. What, is a sl no, whatever. Anyway, so... Uh, no, that's the house. Doesn't matter. Okay. Anyway, so now... So it works like this. So the actual covenant itself was Na'asev and Ishma when the Jews said, we'll do and we'll accept everything. In other words, an unconditional acceptance of the entire Torah. And actually, for all generations, that is what a convert must do as well. The convert is not sufficient to have circumcision, not sufficient to have immersion in the mikveh, it's not sufficient to bring a, uh, a, a sacrifice when it's applicable. It has to be, all of that is only a prelude to the real, ultimate covenant, which is when you say, I do and I accept all the commandments. And that is indeed what is done today. So that's what it actually means. So those are the various components of it. The various... Uh, the various conditions are in order to get the person to the point where it's an unconditional acceptance. It's interesting, Rav Yitzhak, uh, sorry, um, Rav Hertz, Rav J.H. Hertz, who was the chief rabbi of England many years ago, uh, beginning of the 20th century, Rabbi J.H. Hertz, First World War period, Rabbi J.H. Hertz um, had a uh, non-Jewish friend who was a, I think a professor of uh, philosophy perhaps, and this non-Jewish friend had a lot of conversations with Rabbi Hertz and was very impressed with Judaism. And he expressed, he said to Rabbi Hertz, you know, I've been thinking of actually converting to Judaism. And Rabbi Hertz said, really? Yeah, he says, yes, yes. And he says, um, however, uh, I'm not really willing to give up 
uh, the food at my club, I mean, it's just phenomenal. The, the lobster and a fine port after dinner and, uh, you know, I mean, the potted, potted hare and uh, various, uh, the, the, the wild boar. I mean, it's just like, I, I can't give it up. So, so look, I, I'd like to become Jewish, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to, I'm not going to be into that stuff. Robert Hertz said, we can't accept you. He said, well, what do you, why not? He said, on the contrary, he said, Robert Hertz, there are many members of your congregation that eat with me at the club on a regular basis. <laughs> are you telling me they're not Jewish? So, so Rabbi Hertz said, it's a, it's a good point, Rabbi Hertz said, but he said the following, he said, listen, let's imagine that someone applied for citizenship to England, and at the citizenship interview, they say, I want to become a citizen of England, but I'm not interested in this, all this taxation rubbish. <laughs> Everything else is fine, I'll say, God save the Queen, right, I will go to soccer games and beat people senseless, I'll do everything required, I'll be an anti-Semite, everything required for British, British citizenship, right, I will do. I'm just, this taxation business I'm not really interested in. So, Rabbi Hertz said, this is what Rabbi Hertz said, so what would you say to such a person? He says, I'll say, he's not accepted as a citizen. I said the same thing that we say. He says, you don't lose your citizenship if you transgress the law, do you? <coughs> If you don't pay taxes in America, do you lose citizenship? Of course not. You're a citizen, you're a citizen. If you transgress the law, you, you maintain your citizenship. You may lose certain privileges, right? You may lose your right of freedom, you may lose your right to vote, but you're still a citizen. He says, but to become a citizen, you have to abide by the law. Of course, in America, this is not such a great argument because, what, how many, 30 million illegal immigrants, or whatever, anyway, but it doesn't matter, right? But, but um, in, in most normal countries, right, uh, there's actually a requirement that in order to become a citizen, you have to actually accept the law. So that is the same as true here. In order to, ex to become Jewish, they have to accept unconditionally the commandments. And this is true even today, that a convert must accept unconditionally. So basically, what you see from sources, the first and second source, is basically that a, that a convert, um, these three or four ideas are absolutes, meaning, uh, meaning the three preparations, i.e. circumcision, immersion, sacrifice, etc., and the final and the ultimate, the coup de grace, so to speak, which is nasa venishma, we accept and I'll accept unconditionally all the commandments. That means that that convert now has had the equivalent of a Sinai experience, correct? to Sinai experience. Right? And therefore, the convert now is the equivalent of any other Jew. Any other Jew. Maimonides has a beautiful letter. He wrote to, three letters, really, to, uh, to a, uh, an, an Arab who had converted to Judaism by the name of Ovadia. Ovadia was a convert to Judaism at the time of Maimonides, great sage from the 13th century. And Maimonides, uh, he asked Maimonides the following question. He says, can I say in our prayers, blessed you, our God, King of uh, uh, God of my forefathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Can I say that? Can I say in grace after meals, I give thanks to you that you gave the land of Israel to my ancestors? He says, can I say any of those things? It's a good question. Right, can a convert say, stand up and say, Elokeinu, our God, ve avoteinu, and God of our fathers. How can a convert say that? This is what he asked Maimonides. So Maimonides says, proofs, from the Talmud, various places, that he certainly is able to say all of those things exactly as every other Jew. Exactly the same. He says, why, he says? Because you too are a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You, we are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob genealogically, and you are a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob ideologically. We are his children by virtue of the fact that we were born to people who were born to people who were born to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you are his child because he is called Av Hamon Goyim, the father of many nations, and anyone who comes to rest under the wings of the divine presence is considered a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Of course, according to the Zohar, we are said before, they are quite literally a child of Abraham and Sarah. And he says, Al and he says a beautiful statement, he says, Al kal Do not let your, do not let your genealogy be light in your eyes. She'anu mit yachasim. We trace our genealogy. La'avraham li'yitzchak u'liyakov. To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ve'ata mit yaches. And you can trace your genealogy. L'misha amar v'hayah ha'olam. To the one who spoke and created the world. He says, we are descendants of Abraham and you can direct, trace directly to God. And he says, a beautiful, beautiful uh, um, letter to Avadja. There's a second letter also to Avadja the convert. 
The second letter is type of it is a little more uh, exciting. The second letter, uh, Ravadia, uh, Ovadia the convert, um, had uh, his rabbi had expressed the opinion that Islam is idolatry. Now, Ovadia, who had been a Muslim before he converted to Judaism, he, dis- he disagreed. He said, Rabbi, respectfully, I'd like to disagree. He says, I was a Muslim for many years, and it's clearly monotheistic. It's not idolatrous. And the rabbi said, the rabbi got very upset at him, and he said, you're an idiot and a fool. Of course it's idolatry. So Ovadia writes to Maimonides and says, what happened? Maimonides writes back, he says, number one, he says. First of all, he says, you're right, the rabbi's wrong. He said, I've read the Quran, I've gone through the Hadith, I have uh, studied the philosophy of the Muslims, and there's no question in my mind that it's monotheistic, it's not idolatrous, number one. Number two, he says, even if you were wrong and your rabbi was right, what gives him the right to embarrass you in public? Biblical prohibition. And he says, how much more so since you're right and he's wrong? And he says, third, over 30 times the Torah says not to oppress the convert, to love the convert, not to oppress. He says, your rabbi has transgressed over 30 biblical prohibitions. And he says, and fourth, fourth he says, no, fourth he says, so, fourth he says, he says, I'm oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Okay. Uh, the fourth thing he says is that, that, um, that he says, the Talmud says, one who loses his temper should be in your eyes as though he's worshipped idols. So not only are the Muslims not idolaters, but your rabbi is. <laughs> Signed Maimonides. Not the type of letter the rabbi is going to put up in his study next to his, look, I got a letter from Maimonides. <laughs> he says, I'm a pagan. Right? Anyway, so... Um, so that's how Maimonides puts it, because indeed, every person who converts sincerely in the appropriate fashion, such a person has indeed gone through Sinai, and therefore is exactly the same as a Jew who's born Jewish. No difference. Okay. That is the first point. Now, we come to the Gemara in Yivamot, 47b, which talks about a very, very famous law, which is the idea of, the idea of dissuading the convert. It's a strange law person comes and he says, I'd like to become Jewish. What's the response of a rabbi? Now, no, most, in most religions, right, someone comes and says, I'd like to become an uh, evangelist. I'd like to become a Protestant. I'd like to become a Catholic. What do they say? Awesome! Fantastic! Right? And not only that, they actually go out and try to convince you to become one. Right? They come to the door. Hello, you're interested in Bible classes? Right? Well, that type of stuff. Right? So, so they, they do that. Judaism... You come, to, you come to a rabbi, he says, I'd like to convert to Judaism. And the rabbi says, what for? Are you crazy? <laughs> That's what the Talmud says. You're supposed to sell him. What you, you know, he says, he says, Modino, to mix his, his, you know, he says, why? He parish nifos, we want to try and dissuade him. What's the idea? Why are we dissuading him? The answer is very simple. We would much prefer that he remain a sincere Gentile than become an insincere Jew. Before, what do we need? We need it's not, it's not, not, not going to help us. So therefore, we want to, how do you prove sincerity? There's no way to prove sincerity. We don't have like these meters, like Scientology, right? And you've got these like, little, little gullibility meters they have, or whatever they're called, right? So, uh, so you, you can't do that. How can you possibly prove that? The way you do it is, right, you have to you dissuade the person, right? And of course, this is the type of thing that might depend upon circumstances greatly, isn't it? True, right? Because the sincerity, I met, you know, my wife and I were, um, just after we got married in 85, uh, so we went to Moscow to teach. Uh, Moscow at the time, this was pre-Glasnost, pre-Perestroika in Russia. It was, uh, this was the uh, Soviet Union. And there were refuseniks, Jews who had uh, applied for visas to Israel and were persecuted as a result of that. And there was a rabbi called Eliyahu Essas, who uh, had hundreds of people who were studying in classes under his tutelage and uh, organized by him. And we taught for Rabbi Essas there. And, you know, unbelievable. I met a man who converted to Judaism in the Soviet Union during a time, and, and not only that, but once he actually converted, he immediately applied for a visa to Israel, which means you lose your job, your children get thrown out of school, right? He gets harassed by the KGB, so on and so forth, right? Now, am I, an, am I do I have to doubt his sincerity? Of course not. Right? Such a person is obviously sincere. So in other words, sincerity is something which is hard to judge. But one of the ideas is that we, that we try to... And as the Talmud says, a very strange statement, says proselytes are as difficult for, the, for Israel to endure as a sore 
Sapachas. So you saw that time. Anyone wonder what that means? What, why is it? Why? Why are they difficult? There's, there's there's four or five different explanations in the in the in the commentaries. One explanation is actually given by a convert who was uh, one of the authors of Tosfot, and he says because generally the converts are much frumer than the average Jew, and it shows off the Jews you know badly, right? So uh, that's what that's what he wrote, right? In other words, it's like you know he becomes. Because Jewish is much more enthusiastic than other, you know, other Jews have been doing it for years. Oh, yeah, big deal. Been there, done that. And this guy is like, oh, Kiddush, oh, awesome. Look at this, the Kiddush, right? You know, etc. It's like, so, so it's, it makes us look bad. Right? But others say, no, because, because there's always, a, you know, if the person's insincere, it does create problems, creates social problems, creates spiritual problems. They become part of us, and they, if they drop away from their observance, so they're now obligated in it. But they're not doing it. So instead of having someone who's not obligated and not doing it, we've got someone who's obligated and not doing it, which is better. Someone who's not obligated and not doing it is clearly better than someone who's obligated and not doing it. So that is a, that's a that's a that's a severe severe problem. So those are some of the so those are some of the issues. And therefore, what we like to do is we try to determine sincerity. And different courts today have different criteria of that. We'll talk about that more uh, more later. But anyway, the Talmud goes on to talk about the classic case, of course, the prototypical convert, the one from whom we derive so much of our laws of conversion, is actually Ruth. Right? Ruth comes to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she says to her, you know, wherever you go, I'll go. Right? And, and, and the Talmud understands each statement as if that Naomi is actually fulfilling these laws. And she's saying, you know what, why do you want this? Yesterday, if you would have eaten lobster, you would have had a nice meal. Today, if you eat lobster... Right, it's a serious biblical prohibition. Actually, a few of them. Right. Yesterday, had you smoked on Shabbat, all you would have got is emphysema and cancer. Right? Today, right? Today, if you smoke this coming Saturday, right, you'll also get a excision of the soul. You'll get its divine punishment. You know, and, and yesterday you could have been fine. Today you'll be persecuted. And, and yet, what does Ruth say? She says, you know what? Wherever you go, I'll go. Where you live, I'll live. Where you're buried, I'll be buried. The way you die, I'll die. I'm in you. I'm in with it. I'm, 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 I'm in it, right, 100%. That, of course, is the, is the classic situation of the, of the gear. Of course, right, uh, it is one of the reasons, by the way, that we don't encourage converts. Why don't we go out and proselytize? You know, you, know, people, you don't get people coming to, you know, uh, yeshiva students coming to knocking on the doors of Gentiles, right, in, in right, etc. Hi, are you interested in uh, some Talmud classes? Uh, you know, you ever thought about Judaism? We don't do, why don't we do that? Why don't we do that? Now, I mean, think of it, logically speaking, wouldn't it be appropriate to do that? If I've got something which I believe is the truth, I've got something which I believe is going to elevate the person, is going to give you a moral and ethical and spiritual path in life, is going to bring you close to God, is going to bring the world to perfection, wouldn't it be immoral for me to hold it back from people? It makes a lot of sense to proselytize. Right? People who believe in global warming, are they not proselytizing? <laughs> do they not proselytize? Of course they do. People who, are, who, people who believe in the, in the, in the, strongly the war of terror, they try to, every, everyone who believes in some truth, right, it makes sense that they try to convince you of that truth, if they really believe it's true. If you don't care about it, if you don't really think it's true, it's a big deal. But if you really sincerely believe it's true, wouldn't it be appropriate to proselytize? Now, the answer here is very simple, because we believe that a person can be a good person and can have a relationship with God even if they're not Jewish. Surprise. A non-Jew, if they keep the basic moral code of what's called the Noahide laws, they, as Maimonides says, if they do it out of conviction that it's given by God, if they do it sincerely and they don't transgress these laws, basic moral laws, then they have a portion in the world to come. What that means is they have a relationship with the Creator. So therefore, I feel under no moral uh, compulsion to have this person become Jewish. Why? That person can be a good person, have a connection to God, and keep the Noahide laws. Basically, uh, a very, very simple idea. If, however, I came from a tradition which believed that if you are not Jewish, you're going to burn in hell forever, right, then, then wouldn't it be... Wouldn't it be I, I understand why the Catholics, for example, right, or why the evangelists try to convert people, because they believe that if you don't accept Jesus, you will burn in hell forever, even if you've done good stuff. Right? As, is, as in the opening lines of the Athanasian Creed written by Bishop Athanasius. So if that's what you accept, then it would be immoral not to proselytize. Makes sense to me. Right? But from our perspective, we don't believe that you're condemned if you're not Jewish. You don't have as much fun, but you're not condemned. 
right? You don't get to come to things like this, but, but you're not condemned, right? And therefore, I, I, feel no, I feel no compulsion. So that's the idea, basically, this Gemara here. And we see from the Gemara that you saw that Ruth, uh, really, uh, Ruth and Naomi were basically a prototype following these, these rules, these ideals, right? And Naomi was dissuading Ruth, but as soon as she saw it, and as the Talmud says, as soon as you see that the person is in fact sincere, you immediately accept them, because why, as the Talmud says, do not delay the performance of mitzvah. Once it's clear they're sincere, then the conversion should happen without delay as quickly as possible. Because you're not supposed to delay the mitzvah. The only reason we dissuade, the only reason we spend lots of time like that, is to determine their sincerity. But once that has been determined, then that's it. You have to do it. Is this the conclusion you all came to? Okay. Now, we come to another interesting Gemara, also in Yifamot, which talks about someone who... Um, who uh, here is someone uh, who basically wanted, had relationship with a non-Jewish woman, and she became a proselyte. She converted. So the Talmud says that uh, the Mishnah says he's not allowed to marry her. But if he does marry her, the marriage is, is a valid marriage. So that means this. He had a relationship with this, with this woman beforehand, before she was Jewish. And now she decides to convert to Judaism. This is unfortunately uh, a situation which has happened. right? And uh, now, right? Uh, so the Talmud says... He's not allowed to marry her. Why is he not allowed to marry her? Why should he not marry her? Right? So the answer basically is because I guess we are suspecting what? That he is benefiting from his sin. Right? It's like it, he did this sin, right? And now he's reaping the, the benefits of the sin. Right? So, so we, don't, we don't allow that. Right? But, but if he does marry her, Right? If he does, he goes against the, the law and he, and he marries her. You could ask, how does he marry her? The truth is you don't actually need a rabbi for a wedding. You don't need a rabbi for a marriage. According to Jewish law, if you have two witnesses, two witnesses, and you give a ring to this woman, you say, Haram, you are, you are, just one second, you are beholden to me, or you are betrothed to me, according to the law of Moses Israel. That's it, you're married. So, so you, don't, you don't actually need the rabbi. So they, they can get married even though they didn't have permission. Once they're married, the marriage actually is a valid marriage. If they want to break up, they need a divorce. Yes? Um, I thought that uh, marriage between somebody who's Jewish and not Jewish is not recognized. No, no, she converts. I'm about after she converted. They had a relationship before, they, before she converted. If you have a look at the Mishnah, then they converted, then she converts, then he marries her. So in that situation, but the truth is, even though she's Jewish, he's not allowed to marry her. A priori, lechatchila. He's not allowed to marry her. Why? Presumably because he is benefiting from the fact that he had this former relationship with her. He should not do that. But if he does marry her, since, since she is Jewish, and he does marry her, then the marriage actually is considered a valid marriage. And they're, they're 100% married. They want to break up and they divorce. So the Gomorrah here is bothered. Doesn't this seem to contradict the previous Gomorrah we just learned? Right? We just learned that you have to prove the sincerity of this person before they convert. You have to ask, like Ruth has to say, I'm in it no matter what, no matter how much I suffer, no matter how much I'm persecuted, no matter what, even if I have to die, I am into this. Right? And yet, here we have a case of someone who apparently has clearly converted only for one reason. Why is she converting? She wants to marry this guy. So if that's why she is converted in insincere fashion. So how can she be accepted? The Gemara points out, right, what we see from here is, right, implies that she may become a proper proselyte. Isn't this a contradiction? Right? If, he became a, if a man converted for the sake of a woman, a woman became a proselyte for the sake of a man, then we say they're not proper proselytes. So, so, an insincere, so the Gomorrah's final answer is that that is not agreed upon by everyone. Everyone agrees that you cannot accept such a person if they're insincere. But if they did convert, and they were insincere, their conversion is ex post facto a valid conversion. Are we following? Is this clear? Right? This is ex post facto a valid conversion. Now, here we have to distinguish, and a very, very crucial, this is extremely crucial distinction that we have to make. When we talk about sincerity, we're talking about not sincerity in terms of the acceptance of the Torah. We are talking about the motivation to convert. And listen carefully, listen carefully. If they are insincere in their acceptance of the Torah, no one holds that they are good converts. Everyone agrees that that conversion is not valid. What we are talking about here, 
that there's an ex post facto acceptance of the conversion is when, since, when, they, when they really accepted all the commandments, they just did it for the wrong reasons. Is this, is this clear? Well, I'll restate it. Let's say someone decides he wants to convert because he wants to marry this Jewish woman, right? Let's say. And he converts. So, so, but he loves her so much and he's so besotten with her that he actually accepts 100% all the commandments. And he sincerely says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be Jewish. Is that conversion ex post facto valid? What would you say? Yeah. Yes, it is. His motivation was insincere. But the acceptance was complete. Why is it insincere? Because he did it to marry this woman. What's wrong with that? That's not doing it for the sake of the love of Judaism. That's doing it for the sake of the love of a person. So it's insincere. Right? It's not terror. It's, in other words, not, that's, that's the idea. Now, let, let's have another scenario. You've got a guy who's totally sincere. He loves Judaism. He went to a class, right, with this, um, with this uh, I don't know. He went to a class from some rabbi, a new age, right, uh, a rabbi who, who believes that the greatest mitzvah is to hug a tree, right, and, and, he tell, and, he, and he's in love with Judaism, right, and he's not doing it to marry a Jew, he's not doing it for any reason, he's just doing it because he loves the Bible, he's read through it, he loves it, right, he loves it, and, and he converts, right, and so, and he says in his conversion, oh, I accept, I accept the Torah. Is he, is he a valid convert? The answer is no. His motivation is noble, his motivation is there's no there's no there's no financial benefit for him here. There's no there's no physical benefit. There is no love or a benefit. What is there? He just loves the Jews. He loves Judaism. However, has did he have the acceptance? Remember, we said before, what is the what is the covenant itself? The covenant itself is Nasev and Ishmael. I'll accept the commandments. If that's missing, I don't care how sincere he is. He's not Jewish. Is, am I making myself clear? Right? See some confused looks? No. Right? In other words, there's two ideas. Motivation is a requirement a priori. L'chatchila. The person must be motivated for altruistic, it must be an altruistic love of Judaism that motivates him or her to convert. Okay? If that is lacking, ex post facto, the conversion is valid. However, the conversion itself must have a sincere acceptance of the commandments. If they don't accept the commandments, there is no conversion. No matter how sincere they were. And if they were insincere, i.e. if they were not altruistic, they stood to gain money or they stood to gain a, a, a husband or wife, etc. But they really accepted the commandments. They said, oh yes, I'm going to do them. And they really did. Then they're Jewish. Valid. Does this make sense to folks? I see the one question, one second. But understand, is this understood? Okay. Crucial distinction. Yes. What happens if it's undefined? So the acceptance, um, uh, the acceptance of the commandments um, uh, after the fact um, is um, not entirely. Uh, I mean, you, you don't know exactly was the, was it, were you accepting all the commandments or. Uh, in other words, that, that aspect itself is... is well, yeah, that's, that's a question, of, uh, that's a question of, uh, of empirical reality. That has to be determined. You can sometimes determine that there may be evidence, right, by the way this person lives, or does live afterwards. If the person says, I accept all the commandments, and immediately uh, moves to Rancho Santa Fe, right, where the closest synagogue is a 20-mile drive, and that's just your driveway, right, and, um, right, and there, there is no kosher food available for 200 square miles, and no mikvah for 500 miles, right, and uh, then I think I'd suspect that could be that his acceptance wasn't ideal, but right, could be. be. Also, but it could, but it, it, it is theoretically possible that under those circumstances, um, there was, in the situation you described, still possibly uh, there were other other mitigating circumstances, but they were they were really genuinely committed at that. Could point. be, it could be, but it's highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. So the question is: so we go, the we, issue of likelihood. Yeah, or not? yeah, we go by probabilities. Then yeah. marrying Jews in the future generation and stuff like that. Are we to turn around 20 years later and say your motivation at the time of conversion was... If the conversion was invalid, then they were never Jewish. So, so, so I can't tell. It's very hard to tell all the time. But generally, halacha doesn't, goes not by the, 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 the faint possibility, but goes by the probability. Right? If in all probability, in these circumstances, it does not look like that. Now, if it was a, if it was a proper based in, that means it was a duly ordained court of Jewish law, right? and, uh, and they declared this conversion at the time valid, then I'm not going to question that. 
Not going to question that, right? The question would arise when it was when when it was iffy. Right. Uh, so, for example, we have in past in the 50s, 40s, and 50s, there were conservative rabbis who did conversions. Many of these conservative rabbis were actually Orthodox Jews. They kept halacha. Right. They were rabbis of conservative shuls. So, so if they did a conversion, right, there are there are quite it's quite possible that such a conversion was quite valid, even though officially speaking, the conservative movement theologically. Right, is very, has a very different view of the acceptance of the commandments than traditional Judaism, as, as we know, right? So therefore, but, but, so it really depends, I don't get the itty gritty of the cases, but that, that's something which is not so clear cut. But anyway, but what is clear cut is that's required is this ultimate acceptance, what's called Nasev and Ishma. Let me go on, because I'm, I'm going to run out of time otherwise. So that is the, that's the next source. Now the next source we have um, is this, is the famous story of Hillel. Hillel and Shammai, very, very famous. Three Gentiles come to Hillel and Shammai, right, with these bizarre requests, okay? One of them says, I'd like to uh, convert to Judaism, he says to Shammai, on condition that I, I only have to accept the five books of Moses. I don't want to accept the oral Torah. Shammai correctly throws him out. And Shammai was correct. Halakhically speaking, if a person comes to us, it's, it's exactly the same as the professor in England with Rabbi Hertz, Right? I want, to accept, I want to become Jewish. I just don't, I'm not interested in this taxation stuff. I'm not interested in half of Judaism. He can't, so Shammai throws him out. Hillel accepts him. Hillel starts teaching him Torah. Eventually he convinces him of the oral law. He becomes a good Jew. The next one says, this is the most famous. He says, I would like to become Jewish on condition you teach me the whole Torah while standing on one foot. Okay, so, uh, so uh, Hillel, so Shammai throws him out correctly. Correctly. And Hillel says, no worries, mate. Hillel says, right, that which is, I don't know if Hillel was Australian, but it's, you know, most of us Australian Talmudic scholars believe it is correct, right? Is that right, Alon? Right, okay, all right, there we go. So anyway, so, so, like this. So Hillel says, no worries. And Hillel teaches him, he says, that which is hateful unto you, don't do unto your friend. The rest is commentary. Go and learn. Right? He was a rabbi, so he couldn't stand on his foot for that long. Right? So that was it. Right? And uh, now, why is that the encapsulation of Judaism is an entire class in and of itself, uh, which we can do at Od Chazon Lomoed, we'll maybe do it another time. But, but the third says, I'd like to become Jewish on condition that I become the high priest. <laughs> Shammai throws him out. Hillel says, no problem. Hillel starts teaching him. He starts to learn all the laws. The high priest needs to be descended from Aaron, needs to be the, the epitome of purity and so on. And he says, he says, what am I, crazy? I can't be the high priest. And he eventually becomes a sincere So the question we have here is, how could Hillel do this? Does this not... Con- and the question, there's no question on Shammai. Shammai, who ejected them, was 100% correct. Right, Shammai said, you can't make conditions on Judaism. You can't come to Judaism and say, I'm only accepting half, you know, whatever. Right, 300 and, uh, 306 and a half commandments, and that's it. Right, you can't do that. Right, you can't come to Judaism and say, and say I only, you know, d- teach it to me now. Let me do a quick course. I don't really have time for all this stuff. Right, or, uh, and, and in the case of the one who says, I would like to be the high priest, is that sincere? Is his motivation altruistic? That's not an altruistic motivation. So Hillel was, according to Halacha, prohibited to accept him because his motivation was not altruistic. Even if it was so, even if he would accept all the commandments sincerely, which it apparently it appears like he was prepared to do that. These guys were prepared to accept the command. This guy was prepared to accept the commandments. He just wanted to be the high priest. But Hillel was prohibited from accepting him because he wasn't sincere. So how do we understand that? So if you, if those, those who, uh, who got to the, uh, who, who actually made it to the end of the marathon, Right, those who you know the sponge like over the you know, water over it, right, etc. They made it to the end and they saw these last words. Is Tosfot? It didn't get translated, but Tosfot basically asked this question because you know we actually have an interesting Gemara. The Gemara says that in the time of King Solomon, you couldn't accept converts. Why couldn't you accept converts at the time of King Solomon? Talmud says very simple, because the Jews we had an unbelievable. We we were this wealthy, peaceful, idyllic kingdom. People, other people were living under these, these horrific totalitarian regimes, right? Like, you know, surrounding Israel. This is like bizarre. Like, you've got this, this, this idyllic, beautiful country in the middle where people have freedom, 
and people have, have self-actualization and etc. and free will, and they're surrounded by despotic totalitarian regimes. I know it's hard to imagine such a situation, right? Surrounded by despotic totalitarian regimes with not an ounce of freedom, with brutal, brutal uh, governments, and these people look at Israel and they say, oh, I would like to become Jewish. So under such circumstances, you're not supposed to accept converts. Why? Because, because why are they converting? Because it's awesome. Israel is awesome. I happen to think Israel is awesome, right? So if I was, if I was not Jewish, I might want to convert because I want to go to Israel. I want to be, I want to be Jewish, right? Etc. So, so therefore we don't accept. So he says, how could, so Tosfat asks, how could this be? How could he accept this person? Right? It's interesting. On Purim, we dress up on Purim. Right? It's custom to dress up on Purim. One of the reasons is, Tosfot points, he doesn't actually say this, but, but it's interesting because a lot of non-Jews disguise themselves. They became Jews. They, 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 accept, they, they said, yeah, we're becoming Jewish too because they wanted to escape persecution from the Jews. Because the Jews were so powerful when they defended themselves, themselves against their enemies that you had non-Jews wanted to become Jews. Very rare historical circumstance. Usually Jews are disguising themselves as non-Jews Right, in order to escape persecution. He had non-Jews disguising themselves as Jews in order to escape persecution. So such a situation is not, is not, is not acceptable. So Tosfot's answer finally is, he says, Batuach haya Hillel. Hillel was certain that in the end this guy would be altruistic and sincere. So, and uh, he said, that's the idea. And indeed, Rabbi Yosef Karo, in the Code of Jewish Law, the, uh, the author of the Code of Jewish Law says, from this Tosfot we see that the Hakol Lefi Reut Enei Hadayan, everything follows the way that the judge sees things. In other words, there's no absolute set criteria of what determines sincerity. It really depends upon each case has to be looked at differently. The judge, right, in England, for example, the rabbinic courts there require that someone lives an Orthodox Jew for three years before they'll accept them for conversion. However, that same based in London sent people to Moscow and converted this guy within about three months. Why? Do you think he was sincere in Soviet Union converting to Judaism, becoming a religious Jew? As the philosophers say, well, duh. Right? So obviously you didn't need anything else then. It was, it, so you can, you can judge it by the view of the, the judge. So, um, so that's the basic idea. So for example, we have cases, and I, I didn't really have time for this, but there was a, there was a case in Lebanon in 1936. Uh, there was a, there's a, a responder by Ravadya Hadaya uh, in 1936. Uh, you don't actually have it on your sheets, but it's, it's quite long and I didn't have the uh, strength to translate it. But, but you had a Jew who fell in love, a, a Jewish woman who fell in love with a French Gentile who was in the High Commission in Lebanon, in Beirut. And they got, a civil, they got married, they had a civil marriage. And now, after a while, this non-Jew is getting interested in Judaism. And they come to the rabbi and he says, I'd like to convert to Judaism. So the rabbi in Beirut asked Rabbi Vadya Hodaya, who was one of the greatest Sephardi authorities of that century, what should he do? Should he accept this guy? Rabbi Vadya Hodaya says, what do you think he would say? What, what do you think? Based on what we've said above, could he accept this person for, a, for conversion or not? Yes. Correct? What do you say? Gryffindor says correct? Okay, Gryffindor. Anything? Slytherin, what do you... No. Okay. All right. So, so, so the answer is your answer is right. Right. Gryffindor is correct. Two points. Right. Which is that actually, indeed, you could accept. He says why? He says they're already married. Right. He's not converting because he wants the woman. He's got the woman. They're married. They have a civil marriage. He says he's not converting. He's, he says, and on the contrary, the guy actually came of his own volition. Right, because he was interested in Judaism. So in such circumstances, he decided, to, he decided to accept him. But he says the following. He says, but on the condition that you send out a word to the entire Jewish community that the court is only accepting him because there are unique and special circumstances the court does not want to divulge. Why did the court do that? Because otherwise, this is something which is very open to massive abuse. Right, people could abuse this. People could fool, try to fool the judges, etc. And it has happened. Right? And so therefore it's a very, very careful area where we have to be, the judges have to be very, very careful because this is an area of the distinction between the Jewish people and the world. And of course, if we blur that boundary, what happens is the Jewish people will eventually disappear. And so we don't want to blur that boundary, we want to keep it. But this, again, this is not because we're racist, it's because we're ideologists. Because we believe we have a mission. We are on a mission from God.
right? And that mission, right, that mission is compromised when I don't put the jigsaw puzzle pieces together properly. Right? So, and our mission requires a unity of the Jewish people, a unity of the Jewish soul, and a unity of the entire world. That can only be accomplished when there is, when there is intra-marriage, when we're marrying other Jews, and when someone wants to join the Jewish people, they become part and parcel of the Jewish people to the degree that Ruth, right, I will go where you go, I will lay where you lay, I will die with you, I will be buried with you. That level of commitment, that level of sincerity, that level of altruism, that creates someone who is really going to be part of this unity. And that creates someone who can help us in our mission. And of course, our mission ultimately will eventually end in the entire world being united as believing in God, sincere and, and ethical people who are bringing the world back from the bait to the Aleph. Thank you very much for listening. Another big hand. Very Becca. Um, can, I, can I put in a plug, please? Is that I'm okay with a plug? Please, please. I wrote a book called Gateway to Judaism. There are a couple of people here who have it. Right? Gateway to Judaism. So if anyone is interested, uh, I don't have any with me whatsoever. Right? But anyway, Amazon sells it cheaper than I do. So uh, whatever. <laughs> so uh, if you want to get it, it's Gateway to Judaism. Mordechai Becher. That's me. Um, and uh, basically, it's also very efficient because you don't need anything else in your library aside from the Bible. Uh, so it'll save a lot of room in your house, especially if you live in the city. You just have the Bible and Gateway to Judaism. That's it. Right. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much for listening. We'll see. You. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, um, Marisha's 